The Event Tech Podcast is brought to you by Event Hero. All of the event management software features in the world are worthless if they don't easily integrate with your registration system and other systems you need to make your event happen the way you want it to. Stop making superhuman effort and start using your superpowers. Event Hero provides features you need, like check-ins, lead retrieval, analytics, and alerts, all seamlessly integrated with your favorite registration system and other back-end tools. To learn more and to get started, visit eventhero.io. Welcome to the Event Tech Podcast. I'm John Federico, your host and executive producer, which basically means that I'm the guy who turns the knobs and posts the shows. But what that really means is I'm the guy who gets the great guests. And this week is no exception. Uh, So joining me from Portland, Oregon today, we have Joe English. You may know, now Joe has had a a great history as a, as a product manager and a marketer at companies like IBM and Gateway. Remember the, remember the company with the cows? Yes. Uh, and Gateway PCs. Uh, but what you may know Joe uh, best for, at least most recently, would be his role at Intel, um, where he, uh, uh, let's see, Joe's, Joe's official title there was experience designer and event futurist uh, at the Intel developer forum. These days, Joe is a uh, a futurist and, well, I'm looking at his LinkedIn profile, futurist, media personality, and lead consultant at his uh, new consulting firm, Event Futurist. Joe is, as far as I know, uh, the first uh, and only self-proclaimed event futurist. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate your patience, by the way. Uh, so for those of you who watch us, uh, you know, actually, let's do a little housekeeping. A little housekeeping first. Um, you may have heard this, Joe, if you've listened to the show. Um, so you can find us. Where can you find us? Uh, you can find us, of course, uh, at eventtech.co uh, on the web. But you might have found us on iTunes. You might be listening to us in your ears. That's great. Uh, head on over there when you're done, when you get to your office or, or back home and leave us a few stars. We like five stars. Um, if you, ha- if you l- love us, tell the world. If you, if you have a problem with the show, tell me. Uh, and I want to make it better. So let me know about that. You might be watching us uh, right now on our blog. You might see me with the thumbs up right now. That's great. Um, Leave us a comment. That's wonderful. Uh, not on YouTube. I turn the comments off over there. People are nuts. Uh, but, uh, but on my blog, definitely leave a comment. Um, and of course, you know, always, you can always send email to John uh, at eventhero.io with questions, comments, what have you. All right. So long-time listeners may know this is not my typical studio. No, it's not. Uh, in the past uh, month or so, um, my, our family moved to Austin, Texas. So here, are, here I am uh, in my new office, still a bit of a mess, getting it all you know, worked out, uh, but things have changed. So, and Joe, I have to say, through all of that, was very patient. Um, we had a scheduling snafu the first time, and then the second time, well, there was also a scheduling snafu, mostly due to my move. So third time's a charm, uh, and I just want to thank Joe uh, for being so patient uh, in getting this scheduled and sticking through it, because I'm, I'm really glad to have him on the show. Yeah, Thank you, sir. No problem. And and if this means I'm the first guest in your new studio, then I'll take that. That's pretty awesome. You are actually. You were the first <laughs> guest in my new studio, so uh, that's that's true. And I will, this will always be a memory for me now. Excellent. So let's see. First, what is an event futurist? Tell us. Tell tell the world. You know, when when I was at Intel, I started talking to a lot of futurists, people that worked in Intel's labs about the direction of future direction of technology to see how we could apply that to the events business and the events that we were doing. And at some point I said, you know, I should specialize and, and, and do futurism. Futurism is really studying the future and looking out at long-term trends and seeing where technology is going and seeing if we can apply that to what we're doing and make it better. And, and some people will say, they say, well, futurism, are you guessing? Are you predicting? And, and a lot of people say that futurism isn't really about prediction at all. It's about shaping the future that you want to see. So what we try to do is we look at what the opportunities are to make, what can we make better among events and, and the kinds of things that we're doing? And then what kinds of technologies might be coming along the road to help us do that? So for instance, you know, I do a lot of talking about audience acquisition and how so much of what we do in terms of audience acquisition is is kind of 
it's uh, shooting shooting the 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 blasting a rifle out there trying to get the right people to come. Um, but if we can be much more tailored with that um, and 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 narrow in on who we really want to come. Um, we can get better at that, and technology will let us do that. And so we look at what kinds of technologies might be coming in 5 or 10 or 15 years to help us narrow in on a better better audience acquisition techniques. So that's just an example. But there's lots of ways that we can we can look at the future and say, how, how could we do this better? That's a great example. And here's another example. Of course, coming from you, I'm just sort of parroting it. Um, <laughs> I've always wanted to have you on the show. And finally, the tickler for me was I saw a blog post you had written on Wi-Fi Aware. And I said, oh, I got to contact Joe. And that's how I originally reached out. So mm-hmm. let's, let's just start with that, given that that was what I found so interesting and, and such a good trigger for me. Um, Wi-Fi Aware, it sounds like um, the Wi-Fi standards bodies are trying to uh, implement location services and basically replace or, or augment RFID and Bluetooth low energy and that kind of thing. Is that what that is? Well, you know, there's so much in in there's so much information that could be out there in in your pocket when your smartphone is in your pocket. We know we could know a lot more about you when you walk into a booth or you're in a conference. Imagine, for instance, that you and I are standing in the same room and we both are um, we we both are uh, interested in the same topics. We we have the same things on our calendar. If we could make connections between people. Um, then, then we're gonna, we're going to, we can, we can make that time more valuable for the people that are there. So, Wi-Fi Aware is one of a number of technologies that could tap into all of the devices that are there in a room and start helping people make connections. In this case, Wi-Fi Aware is really, it's kind of neat. It's a, ty- it's a part of the Wi-Fi standard that allows you to not have to log into Wi-Fi for the devices to know that other devices are around to talk to them and things uh. like that. I so, so right now, the, the, you know, the pain point is that you may have this device and it has Wi-Fi on it, in it, and an, an event organizer might want to know who all these people are and things like that, but you'd have to log into the network to, to make a lot of this happen. And Wi-Fi Aware, it's similar to some of these other technologies you mentioned, like RFID, where you're, you're wanting to, you know that those devices are there. It would be great if the platform could sort of communicate with itself. You know, uh, these devices can talk to each other. And, um, and then there's all kinds of things that you could do with it. Um, another thing that you could do, um, RFID is one of those things that we've tried to use for data analysis in shows. So when you want to know how long people are spending at each booth or how many booths they visit, things like that, if you could put this into the infrastructure and be able to use these, these Wi-Fi um, connections to count them to see how long they're around um, without having to log into the network you're going to you're going to be able to collect a lot more data because you don't have to have the person take that proactive uh, step of logging in so that's right. that's really where that comes from so so all right we're going I'm going to geek out just for a minute and, and I apologize uh, for those listening Could, couldn't you generally do that in general with mac addresses i mean you know just because a thing isn't logged into the network you could kind of say oh there are x number of devices here but you wouldn't know you wouldn't know how they went, how they moved around a room. You wouldn't know how they moved around a venue, but you still could yeah. count. I would imagine. Yeah, you can. But I, I think the view, the vision of this is that you're the event organizer, and you let's say you write an event app that wants to do something like uh, pass communication between two devices in the room. So again, you and I both have this event app, and we're at South by Southwest, and we're at this party, and we've both said we're really interested in Wi-Fi Aware or whatever the technology is. And if, if this app could see that we both came in, even if we didn't log into the network, it could say, oh, you guys are both interested in this. Maybe I pass a message in the app to do that. So there's, there's a whole other layer of stuff you could do other than just counting people that could be very interesting for the event space. Absolutely, absolutely. It's sort of, that, that is sort of the holy grail. Uh, <laughs> and companies like, like Bizabo, uh, if you know mm-hmm. Bizabo, uh, or they got that's how they got their start. And uh, except again, there was there was some effort involved. Uh, and even here at Event Hero, that's how we got our start. Uh, very early on, we actually in, in the earliest days, uh, we created an application that sucked in data from uh, registration systems and, and helped people connect uh, by, by using their social networks and a whole bunch of things. So lots of people have tried uh, ha- have tried it. 
but it's it's still it's one of those one of again one of those holy grails of uh, I guess you couldn't have multiple holy grails, could you? But anyway, you get the idea. Uh, it's one of those things that everyone wishes uh, would occur without it being creepy or requiring too much in terms of bootstrapping, like too much effort on the yeah. part of attendees. It's got to be seamless and easy. Right, and 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 the great thing about Wi-Fi is that Wi-Fi will be embedded in pretty pretty much every device, um, any smart device. So if it was say RFID or iBeacons or something like that, you 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 know, there's you're starting to limit the number of people that might have a technology, or maybe it's something you have to put into a badge or something like that. Um, even cellular phones, they all work on different standards and things like that. But Wi-Fi is one of those things that's in the on the client. It's practically ubiquitous and it will just get more so because it's um because it's 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 getting integrated into so many things like pcs and tablets and phones and smart watches and things so, so there's just a lot of places that you'll find it and the internet of things and let's not forget yeah. that i mean if you can right. put wi-fi in a, in a phone you can mm -hmm. put it in anything uh we just bought a new house here and and my thermostat has wi-fi you know, it's yeah. bigger than any other thermostat. And, yep. you know, and, that, and so you have Nest devices like Nest and you have the ones that came with our house, the Honeywells. Um, but yeah, you, you could, they're, they're going to squeeze it down so it's smaller and smaller and it will, be, it will pretty much be the ubiquitous mm -hmm. technology that we're looking yeah. at. And so to, so I, what, something I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of go over. So you had, a, you had a long history at Intel. So not only were you, were you uh, a marketer and, and an a, a event planner, uh, you know, and, and, and a futurist to yourself at, at there, but you're working in a technology company. So you're surrounded by all these people who are already thinking about the future. Um, whether it's event related or not, it, they're still thinking about what's, what's new and what's coming. Um, so during your time there, what were some of the things that uh, you, you were able to implement just given the scale of the company and, and all of that? What were some of the things you were able to implement um, either early or, or what you felt was a the appropriate time? Uh, that that some people were just kind of you know exploring. Like, does anything come to mind? Yeah. Well, first I should say that just like any other company, um, when you're in an event business, you have all the same problems that everybody else does. Where the te the budget, you may say, oh, we got this great technology, and of course the budget is well, how much do we have to spend on food and this and that, and so all those same things exist. So. Every year, every time we plan one of our developer forums, it was always top of my list to say, I want to demonstrate the coolest technologies. I want to really wow people. But we always had to have those same conversations that everybody does, which is, can, sure. can we afford this? And, and that was always the case. But, you know, some things that early things that started to come out, the, the idea of a mobile app. We started launching mobile apps many years ago um, as different kinds of customized apps. And, 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 and as you learn with all technologies, sometimes things are too early, right? And when, when we launched our first mobile apps, they were designed for Blackberries uh, and PC client devices. And I think the first one we did probably was also iPhone. Um, but, but, you know, there weren't a lot of devices there. So people would say, oh, well, you know, I can get this same information on paper. And it was like, it was really early. Um, another one was, um, uh, was, uh, um, now I'm now I'm even blanking on the names for them because it's been so long. But the little the little tags that you scan um, the um, uh, to get more information about things. Uh, was it Pokin? Were those the Pokins? Uh, no, or are they RFID tags or NFC tags? No, I mean the ones that you scan with the scanner on your phone. Oh, uh, QR. You mean a QR code scanner? Ah. Yeah. Okay. This has been so many years now. One of the first exhibits that I designed at Intel, we actually embedded QR codes into them so you could get more information about all this stuff. And people just, they just had such a tough time getting the QR code readers and things. So that was sort of, that was sort of one of those things, key learnings as well. You can do it. Is, is, is the client going to be there to, uh, to be able to take advantage of it? Another really good one, we, we did some really neat early things with augmented reality where you could hold up your phone and look around the technology showcase and see the names of the exhibitors. Um, that was really cool. It was one of those technology demos that I always remember. Uh, but again, people were a little were like, wow, well, okay, that's, that's way ahead of its time. So a lot of times we were way ahead of our time, um, but, but that's okay because, because eventually this stuff will come out and and it, um, it's really neat to experiment with it and see what, what attendees value because that's ultimately what you're looking at. They go, oh, we need more of that. Yeah, I would say that is the benefit of experimenting. And not everyone wants to be the guinea pig. 
right? Uh, but but for those who are are willing to are brave enough to take a step forward, uh, you know, you learn from it by design. I guess the the world learns from it as as well. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So uh, augmented reality, I like that. I mean, we've always joked about that too. But, but the privacy implications would be crazy if you could if you could do that with people. <laughs> you could go through a room and you could say, "Oh, that's Joe England. I'm going to go say hi." But that would be, yeah, a little. I guess well, uh, okay, in in seriousness, uh, uh, there's there's some cool ideas around this where you start where you start adding intelligence into mobile apps to that level. And if you start listening to what people are saying, and I know anytime you talk about listening, people get nervous about privacy and stuff. But I always, I always imagine that you're, you have the cocktail party that's going on, that ultimately there is, and two people are both talking about the score of the game, right? Uh, the baseball game, the soccer game or something. And both of them in their ear get a little notification that says, you know, this person over there is also talking about the game. Maybe you should go talk to them. And I can lead you to them and, and direct you over to them. And, and, you know, this may sound far-fetched, but it's not. This is stuff that's really not that far off to be able to do. But you think about the power of when we bring people together into one place, what we're doing is, is we want to take advantage of the fact that everybody's together, right? I can sit at home and watch the keynote on my computer, but if if I'm there in the convention center with all these other like-minded people, you know, it would be great to meet the ones that are important to me. So anything that could drive us together that finds those points of similarity that whether we opt into them or if it's an active listening or something that says, Oh, these guys are talking about Wi-Fi aware. We should connect them because they might be the two people that, you know, that, that shape the future of that technology. If we brought them together, or whatever the subject is. So, so I think there's some amazing things that we can do with technology to help that process along. I, I agree, actually. And, and to be honest, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, you know, there are lots of applications that, that do a lot of background audio processing. And they don't actually listen to what you're saying. They listen to uh, the tone and the camber and, and all the things related to your speech, and they'll match, up, they'll match things up based on that. That's how Shazam works. You've seen the Shazam app? Where yep. uh, right, so you can play it in front of a, p- a piece of music, and then it'll display yep. what what the music is. It's not much different than that. Um, yeah, it's that's a, see, I hadn't thought of that already. Already, we're thinking thinking bigger here. That's good. Well, I, and I think of like a dating app that says, you know, instead of Tinder where you're looking at pictures, it's like, oh, that person just told your friend the guy over there at the end of the bar is you know really cute. Um, we, should we send him a drink? And then the you know we know what he's drinking because you know, and we send it over to him. You know, you can imagine the way that you could connect people in in ways that, and that I know that sounds it sounds kind of far fetched again, but think about how fearful you might be. Um, to walk up to somebody in a bar and ask them to dance or to for a drink or something. But if technology could break down some of those barriers in natural ways, and we know that these people are compatible because they're both talking about the same thing or, or we know a lot about them, all of a sudden it's like it's, it's, it's alleviating a, a social burden that could be very, very cool. You know? I, I, have this, I have this picture that I show in some of my presentations. It's a huge crowd of people, and, I, and there's these two guys standing there with their phones right next to each other and they're both texting and I put arrows on them and I said, this guy needs to meet this guy. And that's like always my, I, how do I, how do I make sure that these two guys meet? Because this is, you know, in my mind, this is, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer or, or, you know, Steve Jobs or something. And I, and what if they were standing right next to each other and never met? You know, it's like if as event planners, if we can facilitate that that is so powerful for the attendees because they they will come away going wow i met like the most important person that i could have met and if i facilitated that then i just became their hero as a as an event organizer right absolutely we, we all want to be heroes like you <laughs> <laughs> there you go but th- that's the thing is just uh it, it, it's Today, in today's world, where things are digital, and we can we can we can have this conversation, record it halfway across the country, um, uh, you know, content is 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 a commodity. Now, I won't say it's a commodity in the sense that uh, it, it, the content itself is not y- unique. But the delivery of that content is a commodity. I don't need to get on a plane anymore to go experience that. So then, what else is there? What is the added value? Well, it's the people. Of course, it is. 
you know, it's the people, stupid. Uh, it's all about the people. Um, and to the extent that you can make those connections happen, uh, your events will be much more sought after, I would say, than, than any, any others in, in the category. You want to make, make sure that you're really optimizing what you do with people's time. And, it, and this varies depending on the age group, too. Um, millennials, younger consumers, tend to want to not be sitting in keynote halls listening to somebody. They want to be networking and finding opportunities. Um, older Gen Xers and boomers, they want the slides and they want the takeaways. So people are a little different. But you're absolutely right that the, it, it, when we take advantage of people's time in a positive way, when we actually get them to meet other people, to, to make connections, with, get them into the right classes, uh, make sure they meet the right exhibitors, all of that it just adds to, their, to the value of their time, which is really important. Yeah, time is, time is one of my biggest challenges. Well, everyone's right. There's only a finite amount of time. But um, uh, even I, a person who runs a software company for event planners to help them save time, um, I, I don't attend events unless... I find that I don't attend events unless I, I book meetings in advance because the serendipity for me is, it feels like a time waster. Like it, it is great to meet people out of nowhere uh, and to just bump into them and suddenly find out that we live in the same town, we know the same people, we are, have the same hobbies, and then, oh, by the way, we're also in business and let's talk about that. So there is something about that, but I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's anxiety. I just... <laughs> I just feel like I need to have a purpose when I get there. So I'm more likely to attend an event when I schedule at least one or two quality meetings and then let every, let the serendipity ha happen around those. And that's, and I say, I, I don't think I'm alone in that, but I think I probably need to just relax a little and, and go to more events and just let things happen. Right now. Well, and the opposite is sometimes people will be completely scheduled and then they miss out on those opportunities. So, so there's a balance, right? Is, is to, you, you do want to go and make sure that you've, You've figured out what is going to be valuable to you at a conference, right? And and plan around that. But you also want to leave yourself open for to new opportunities. I actually I actually talk about that. I call it the serendipity effect, which is that sometimes we don't know what we're looking for. We don't know that who we're going to meet, and we and we can't plan for that. So it's it's good to leave space to do those things. And um, and I also. You know, I think technology can help us in this space too, because if we start watching what people are doing, and I and I see that somebody has gone to five booths in a specific segment, but they missed one, and there was one that's over in that other hall, and they didn't know about it. It'd be great if again I got the notification in my ear that says, "I see you're going to the taxi line, but you missed one of the exhibitors that's that's talking about this technology that you're really interested in." You know, if, if I were able to do that with technology, that again would really help that attendee, and that and that's that's ultimately what our goal is. I, I couldn't agree more. There is though, there is something about things that happen online versus what happened in the real real world, and how mm -hmm. the online stuff is not so creepy. The real the real world world stuff can be considered creepy, right? And so I think about the example you just made, which I would find very valuable as a professional, but as a person, I'd be like. Someone's watching me, right? So, so how do you how do you break that barrier down? How do you, how does I mean I don't know is that is that a cultural systemic thing that just needs to happen over time or is there something you could do as the as the planner to break down that barrier? So I think there's there's three things there. First is that we always want people to opt in when to do things, right? And and the second is we want to make them aware that these things are going to happen. So you need to be proactive with the communication and say things like. We are providing this new service that will look at your path through the showcase, and and we might make suggestions for you. Okay, so so that would be something that would make it less creepy, and then we would also give them the opportunity to opt out of it, right? If you don't want this, just tell us, and we won't we won't. And and then the, another layer to that is that you always have to be clear on what kinds of information you're capturing about people. Um, you know, we may we may be just noting what places you've been, but we're not going to keep that or we're gonna, not going to identify that in any way. Those, those kinds of things make it feel less creepy. But the third thing, and I think probably the most important, is that the direction we're going with technology as we look longer out is this concept of, of reducing or eliminating the user interfaces um, that we're used to. Right now, we, we are used to typing things in and, and looking things up. But over the next five to ten years, you're going to see a great reduction in that where, where it's just going to feel more natural for computers to suggest things to you. 
because the interface is 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 going to be reduced, and that's a, that is a positive thing. Um, we shouldn't have to spend so much time trying to figure out the right way to interface with technology. It should adapt more to us, and as that happens, we'll get we'll find it less creepy and more helpful. Uh, but it, uh, admittedly, today it is a little strange when some of these things happen. Speech, I have a new speech and gesture. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a new product at home that I've been playing with. It's called Amazon Echo, and um, it listens to things. It doesn't it, it it doesn't actively listen to your conversations and things. But what it does is, when you give it a command, you her her, her name is Alexa. She has a personality, and you say Alexa, you know this or that, and then she responds to you. And when I first got it, my son, who's eight years old, he's so excited. He's like, "Wow, the computer will do whatever I tell it." Um, and, and this is an example of there's no user interface on that product other than your voice. There's no other way to, to right. type in something to it. Um, but we've also found that over time, she doesn't, she doesn't get it right all the time, right? Because, it, because the user interface is sort of, it's still a little bit crude. I um, mean, it has to listen to voices. Um, we have to figure out what the words are to get her to do something, right? So you can't just say, you know, we could say, uh, play something and play always has to do with music and her vocabulary. So if we want to play a game, we have to say start the game. If you say play this game, she thinks we're talking about music. So even though there's a sort of a appearance that there's not that much user interface, there is a user interface. It's just something we still have to learn. So the point of all this is that uh, over time, I think these, these user interfaces get smarter and they'll know the difference. They'll distinguish the difference between um, these fine distinctions where I say, you know, play this game and they aren't looking for a, a, a music song there. They, they know that I, I have a different meaning for that. So I think, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I try and teach that to my, my wife as well. Cause she's not, you know, she's, I'm just starting to get her to use Siri and it's the same thing. It's, you know, Siri on the phone, you tell Siri what to do and you got to do it in a certain way. Uh, but I think gestures uh, as well as miniaturization will help a lot with that. So, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me now, you know, people love their Apple watches. I don't have an Apple one, but, um, but I do have a runner's watch. You see. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Duathlon. Um, and, uh, but I think gestures will help as well as miniaturization in the sense that there is no reason that we all couldn't have hearing aids, right? Yeah. Most, uh, there are many hearing aids, brands of hearing aids that are nearly invisible because they're so small, they fit right in the ear canal. I could almost envision something like that that allows ambient sound, just like a hearing aid, so you don't lose what's happening around you like I, I do in these headphones right now. Uh, and then it could listen to what I'm saying and I could give it voice commands. I think gestures and voice, uh, once you get that down to something really tiny, I think could be useful. So you don't look like the guy with the boom microphone, you know, or the earbud, you know, walking around as we, as we see them in the subway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. The technology will get smaller and smaller. And you mentioned the Internet, Internet of Things, but the um, these kinds of devices, user interface devices, continue to get smaller too. And eventually, the the the, the longer term, as it gets implanted into your inner ear, you know, and and you just have this device that has a little um, interface to the technology, to the cloud, to the smart networks, and you'll you'll just be plugged in from birth or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Not that long off, but I'm sure, I, I know I've seen people working on technology like that already. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, you know, just in the consumer space, uh, Motorola and a, and a few other companies make a, an extremely tiny headset. It has no boom. But the microphone just, I guess it just works. Some of it's bone induction, I believe. So it, it picks up the vibrations. And it, it's still, you can still see it if I turn my head. It's larger than my ear canal. But it is still, it's getting there. It's, it's really tiny. It's about, uh, let's say, the diameter of a quarter. Yeah, maybe somewhere between a nickel and a quarter, and uh, and it's got twelve hour battery life. It's so we're getting there. Close, you know, we're getting closer. Yeah. So what? So, Mister Futurist, what what are some of the things you're looking at today? Um, both just that you're generally interested in, but also that some of the some people have come to you and said, "Hey, Joe, can you help me solve this problem?" Or or you know, where should we be looking? What what, what comes to mind there? Well, I already mentioned um, audience acquisition as a big prime area for for uh, technology to help us out. And I think it is one of the big areas because um, the technology that's on everybody's mind or the word that's on everybody's mind is big data because big data is really about um, bringing together complex sets of information and being able to extract some really cool meaning out of them. So the fact that, that, that you went to a trade show 
and six months later bought a computer or a car or something like that, those, those type pieces of information exist, exist in very different places. And so right now it's hard to make those connections. But big data over time is the one that will connect all of that. And again, you know, you might say, well, is that creepy? Um, it, 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 it will not feel creepy when, it's va- when there's value there longer term. But, you know, I was just, ex- I, was, I was saying earlier, I was excited about uh, Google announced a new technology yesterday called TensorFlow um, that is, is designed to, to allow people to take these really powerful um, computing networks, smart computing networks, and put them to work in applications. So you can imagine that somebody may, may take these new technologies and apply them to audience acquisition. Um, because ultimately, we want to get the right people to events, and we do we do a fairly poor job um, at most events um, where you know you may have you know, ten thousand people or a hundred thousand people that you you uh, are targets to, that you talk to before you go to a big event like the Consumer Electronics Show or an auto show or something like that. It'd be great if we could actually narrow in on the five or ten or hundred people that really want we want to be there, um, and and I. I liken that to, I call it the name badge approach is what we use today, which is the name badge tells you a person's name, the company they work for, and probably their title. And if we're only getting audience based on those three vectors, then we have very limited information about people. Um, in technology, what it'll, it can allow us to do, and what I'm most excited about is the time when we can say a hundred different things about someone and say, I don't want uh, consumers to come to my event or even auto buyers or even dentists. I want a hundred Joe Englishes in the room, right? Or a hundred John Federicos. And, um, you know, we, we like to think of ourselves as snowflakes, right? Everybody's unique. <laughs> I mean, look at, look at what we're, the conversation we're having to, to, you could not find two more geeked out tech professionals in the event business than the two of us that are talking right now. <laughs> we probably would go down a list. Yep. A lot of characteristics the same, but no, we had not met before today. So um, technology is, I think, going to promise to help us to get there. Um, and today it's hard to do it. We can get the information. Um, there are apps that are helping us do it and, and software providers and people, but I think it's going to get a lot easier as we get out into the future. What's the biggest barrier there? I mean, you know, to your point, let's use your, your example almost verbatim, which is someone attended an event and then six months later made a purchase uh, based on, uh, maybe not solely based on that experience, but that was a touch point and, and it, should be, it should be attributed somewhat. Something should be attributed to that touch point. Yeah. What's the barrier in the event space now for making that happen? But today the barrier is the, that the data is very siloed and proprietary, right? So, so the, the future would be that you went to the show, you bought something on Amazon, you paid for it on your credit card. Um, somehow those distinct databases get joined. Um, and today the credit card company and Amazon and the people from CES, are not, they all hold their data um, in a proprietary manner, they they don't want to necessarily share that because they have um, customer information and and strategic intelligence that comes out of that. But what will happen over time is there will be this idea of aggregation, third party networks that scan this data and make these connections without actually having to compromise the data. Um, it's that's that's just start. It's it's a nascent kind of part of the technology. But today, I think there's a lot of fear around losing. Um, losing your uh, your proprietary information, and that's what is the barrier. Now, on smaller scales, like you mentioned, that um, companies, software providers, they may provide information for a bunch of different events. Um, if 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 a information systems provider was what happened to have all those pieces of data, they could join those together. Right. But it's you know, it's I've seen some early. Uh, networking apps for events and things where they do that, where you create a profile and you, um, if they happen to be the, the provider of the, the registration tool for these different events, then you get some great benefit because they say, oh, at the last event you went to, you went to these, these um, classes. So maybe these are the ones that we know this about you. So these are the ones that are going to be important to you. Um, but, but it will take more time until the, the data is really aggregated at the level to do what we're talking about. 
Yeah. And, and also just the nature of, of the events of the live events business. Um, it, it tends to be very competitive and very closed. Uh, yeah. and that's not a criticism, you know, time, you know, people always treat this, the events, live events industry in general, right. Whether that be corporate or, or for-profit or nonprofit or whatever, um, you know, as a net zero sum game. And, and in a way though, it's true because you know what, the budgets are only so big and, and time is finite. Uh, so if, if, if I'm a busy professional and I can only dedicate, uh, I'll just make it up. I can only dedicate three to four conferences, you know, an entire year, um, because either my schedule's crazy, uh, or my budget is limited or both. Um, then in some respects I could see why it's so competitive because someone's going to say, well, there's this conference on big data and this conference on big data, which one do I go to? And obviously those two organizations are competing for time and budget and they don't want, they don't want to, to provide, why should they give the other a competitive advantage from their own data stores? So I get that. But in the long run, I feel like there's more value in the, in the, now we have to prove this, of course, this is a, this is a hypothesis. Um, but I feel like there's going to be more value by sharing some of that data uh, than there would be uh, uh, in hoarding it. And that's, that's a personal opinion, and, and it's going to be difficult to prove that until other people cooperate. But mm-hmm. I don't know. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, anytime we operate out of a sense of fear, it's probably not a positive place to, to start from. So if the fear is I'm going to lose my data, I'm going to lose my strategic advantage, then that's a, that's a bad place to be moving from. Um, privacy is the same. We brought it up a couple of times already. People are essentially afraid of uh, compromising their privacy or having their identity stolen or something like that. So what we need to do then is, is fix those problems and make sure that, that data is secure um, and prove that to people so that they'll be able to do it. Um, and that's why I think that, you know, that some of the people that are approaching this are third parties. They're completely, they're trying to say we're completely unbiased. We, we don't, we don't right. care, you know, what you bought from Amazon. What we're trying to do is find patterns of consumers and see what kind of consumer you are, for instance. Um, and when we, can, when we can draw those connections, a, a pattern might be, for instance, that someone is is not just that they go to a bunch of trade shows or, uh, you know, imagine that you're sort of tracking somebody's activity and you see that I go to lots of trade shows. Well, that's because I'm in that business. That's very different than somebody that goes to a bunch of events because they're really interested in some topic and they also have a million followers on Twitter and they also, you know, teach a class at a university. All of a sudden, they become what we might call a super consumer or a super advocate Mm -hmm. in some area. And if we could put that together and say, oh, this person is really important to the automotive industry or to the, you know, medical business, then all of a sudden they become somebody that we could target for audience acquisition purposes in a different way. I, I, I often tell this story that a long time, a number of years ago at Consumer Electronics Show, um, I would always get invited to, to come to things. People would say, oh, I want to have a meeting with you because I want to talk about, you're in marketing for Intel, so I want to talk to you about um, uh, advertising sales. But I didn't do advertising sales. I had nothing to do with advertising, so I always thought those were kind of silly requests. But then one time this uh, company called Garmin that makes sports watches um, they had figured out that not only did I work for Intel and was in marketing, and I had, but I was also a runner and had a big following writing about running. And they invited me to come to their booth to talk to them about their product. And I, I went to that and I said, well, how did you figure this out? And they said, well, you know, we, we read the blogs of people that use our product. And, and, and they had done it very organically. But what they identified was much more than what I referred to earlier as that name badge level, they were operating at a much deeper level to say, this is the type of person we need to be talking to. And I think that, you know, that that is powerful when we move forward. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Actually, so timely. uh, There was, uh, I just, (laughs) I read an article today and I posted it to my Twitter feed. uh, And I'm going to pull it up, actually. It takes a second. But it it basically says um, that uh, the premise is being that that marketing, uh, customer support, and um, uh, marketing, customer support, and community building um, are all the same thing, right? Support, marketing, community, and PR, they're all the same thing. And that's a perfect example of it is 
uh, you know, they, they want to engage people. They, they went out to the community, they went out, which is their community of customers, and they found people who use their product and they were passionate about it. And really, it solves uh, maybe not support, although who knows, maybe, they, maybe you had a problem, but a question about the, 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 uh, the product while you were there. But it definitely, hit, it definitely hit marketing, community, and PR, all three of those, in that one yeah. conversation. But that's, you know, so they had a, they had a tremendous reason for doing that. Um, right. when, you're, when you're on a planner, you know, sometimes you don't have that kind of budget or that you don't have that kind of drive to, to really go out to find those people. You know, you could be a trade association with a limited budget. Yeah. Um, you know, so how do you make it affordable for those people? That's going to be, in my opinion, the, the, the toughest thing, right? Yeah. Well, so that's available right. to everyone. I agree. It's about, that's where technology starts to help us. Right now, we do it, I say we kind of do it by hand. Um, and, it's, and it's the people that have the time and the, and the access to resources and things to do that. But over time, to be able to, right now when you get a spreadsheet that has 70,000 fields in it, you just want to kind of throw up in your back of your mouth a little bit. But, but in the future, to get all this data and have the computer spit out, here are the five people that you really should come to your show. You know, don't, don't, don't do a show for a thousand people, get these five in a room because they're the ones that are going to be the most important to you. When you start operating at that level, it completely changes the way the meeting feels, right? Because all of a sudden you move from, you know, the hotel ballroom with a thousand seats to the really nice, uh, um, you know, boardroom with 10 seats because you can spend your $50,000 budget on those five people, right? It's, it completely changes the character of the event, or it could. Um, I was asked to consult on, on an event um, uh, a year or so ago where they, um, with people had in their mind, they wanted to do this 500 person uh, event, charity fundraising event. And we sat down and we talked about it and talked it through. And we had profiled you know, who could actually come? Who could afford to make the kinds of donations that they could? And we found out there were like three people that could actually be qualified to, to be in this room. And we said, well, why are we doing this big ball? Let's, let's do an event for these three people. And that's, that is what we're getting at here is, is we want to get the right people, not just people, you know. And my, my friend, one of my friends that does surveying, he, he looks at crowds and, and he once looked at this picture of a crowd and said to me, he says, is it an is it an audience of nothing, right? And that was the that, question he wants to know. And, and and I've always I've never forgot that. It's like you can have hundred thousand people come to your show, but if only a thousand of them were the right people, then you know, we we missed. <laughs> we spent a lot of money on people that didn't need to be there. I will also remember that. Yeah, it's absolutely audience of nothing. That's that's yeah. And I can say even as an attendee. I've had that experience, right? How many times have you been to an event with an expectation that there will be a certain type of person in the room and all the people you encounter, are nothing like that. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly it makes you question your decision to be there. Yeah, it was an event last week where somebody had invested a tremendous amount of money to bring this gigantic piece of equipment to the show. Um, and I, as soon as I walked in, I thought, hmm, why is that here? Nobody is going to be here at this show that would be, uh, would be appropriate to, to, to be a customer of this. But some, as it went wrong somewhere. Somebody thought that that was going to be the right audience that would be there. And they spent a lot of money that they probably didn't need to. Ouch. Yeah. Well, good. We didn't, you didn't mention names, so that's good. So now you'll feel bad for that. All right. So I, I always do this, especially when we geek out. Uh, I always say it's going to be a 20 to 40 minute interview when already we're, we're going around that. So I want to respect your time and my audience's time, but I want, I want one more nugget from you. Yes. What's the, what's the most outrageous thing that you've been, that you've been thinking about with respect to the future of events? And it could be technology related. It could not be. What um, comes to mind? Yeah. You know, I don't find anything to be completely out of bounds and outrageous. I, as, as I already said, I, I think about, you know, implanting stuff in people's heads and, and them being, you know, excited about it. But maybe, you know, um, farther out would be, we, we've talked about that right now, the value of events is, is to facilitate networking among people, right? Because we can, as you said, we can de deliver content to people pretty easily. They can listen to it, watch it from their home. They don't need to travel. So the question would be, you know, what would be the craziest way that you would start removing the need to actually travel to an event and still keep the character an event. And that would be some kind of holographic technology that brings people together to be able to interact like people um, and do people things, but um, not actually be physically face to face. So I think, you know, 
I, I say these things and I, I think, well, I don't know if I'd really like that because I actually, you know, I like meeting people and I, I actually want to put on pants, you know, once <laughs> I get out of the house uh, or get out of the office because I work from home. I, I hardly ever leave unless I'm going to an event. So if I got rid of events, then I would be really sad because I would never get out. But, but I think that that could be something that's sort of on the wacky side out there would be, um, not video conferencing. Video people do not act the same way in person that they do in a video conference. But in a in a way that you could you could really interact with people, um, and 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 have that um, experience that we have when we're interacting with people live, but not have to actually go there because that's. I always think about the scalability of events, right? You know, when you've worked on something, a presentation or something, and only two hundred people got to see it. Um, but the audience, the bigger audience for something might be, you know, worldwide might be many thousands of people. So it's like, how do we facilitate that kind of sharing? And those are the, those are the interesting places for me for technology in the future. I love that. I, I haven't thought about that in, in a while, the, the whole uh, holographic thing. There's a, if you're a sci-fi fan, I don't know if you are. I am. There's a trilogy of books. Uh, and it, I'll put it in the show notes and I'll email it to you later as well. Uh, and so apologies for those of you, I can't think of it right now, but the entire, one of the key tenets of the book is virtual reality, not virtual reality. I'm sorry, is, is holographic virtual reality. So, uh, telepresence, think of it, think of it as, so it's exactly as you just described where you move around the space, uh, and it, as you're there, but you're not actually there. You can't touch things. You can't manipulate things. But you can speak and look at people from a certain point of view and walk around a room. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing book. It really was a, was a, a key component there, and it really made the book. So I'll make sure to put that in the in the show notes. Well, you know, I, I get a lot of inspiration, as a lot of futures do, from Star Wars movies because because Star Wars is awesome. And and this is a big year for Star Wars. We're all really excited. I, I already have, as I said, I already have my tickets for, for the opening day to see The Force Awakens. But, the, you know, they, they have the the um, the Jedi in their council room um, are all holographic, sitting on their chairs, interacting with each other when they're not actually there. And that that's a very... You know, it's it's a it's a just another way to think of how we could interact would be if you had the sensation of being there and being able to actually look around and touch people and and things that we could do some of the things we do today without having to travel or to be much more dispersed than we are. And we, yes, and we are getting there. So there's uh, a few episodes ago, I interviewed Ashley Crowder. She's the co-founder of Ventana uh, out of L.A. and uh, They've done some things uh, you, you should check out. You, you check out the interview and also check out their site. They did some really interesting things uh, with holographic imaging, um, both in a lot. Uh, when I say live setting, I mean sort of an odd live audience setting. Mm -hmm. But apparently, and I haven't seen the video yet, they have done some really interesting things around things like, like uh, point of sale displays. So you could quite literally interact with the point of sale with a, a person or a holographic person at a point of sale display. And it just blew me away, the whole conceptually. It's, yeah, well, it's, it, it, there's always there's always a line we don't want to get rid of the events, like I said, because we want to go outside and we want the humanity of being around people. That's that's important. But we also want to scale events. We want to bring people together. We want to exchange information, different viewpoints from people around the world. So technologies that can help us, that's exciting. Yeah, agreed. So now, of course, the final question, Joe, is yeah. you're in your home office. Yes. Do you have on pants? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I do, um, <laughs> I do. It, it, but only because I... I have been been asked that before, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes people will say, "Well, do you really have pants on?" Yes, I do. Yes, you do. I'm just kidding, of course. But I, I'm in my home office, and I do not have pants on because now I live in Austin. Now I live in Austin, and uh, it's still 75 degrees, and I have shorts on. So there you go. Well, enjoy that weather because you know that's better than New York's weather. It's going to be this winter. You got it. It's one of the reasons we're here. All right. Well, Joe, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I, I could continue this conversation for another hour easily. Uh, but as I said, I like, to, um, I like to respect everyone's time, including my guests. So uh, I won't keep you on the line much longer. But if people want to reach out to you and thank you for joining me today for this conversation, how can they do that? Sure. Uh, best way, if you're on Twitter, is I'm at Event Futurist. And, uh, and my website is at the same, www.eventfuturist.com. See, you, you had the foresight to snag that URL, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, for those of you tuning in, once again, this is the Event Tech Podcast. And uh, if you like us a lot, 
uh, head on over to iTunes and give us a few stars. Uh, maybe leave a comment uh, on our blog if you're watching this video. Uh, and of course, you know, reach out to me. I'm John at eventhero.io. Make sure you get the IO properly. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, let me know if you have any thoughts or comments about this show. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. The Event Tech Podcast is brought to you by Event Hero. All of the event management software features in the world are worthless if they don't easily integrate with your registration system and other systems you need to make your event happen the way you want it to. Stop making superhuman effort and start using your superpowers. Event Hero provides features you need, like check-ins, lead retrieval, analytics, and alerts, all seamlessly integrated with your favorite registration system and other back-end tools. To learn more and to get started, visit eventhero.io.